Thank you very much. Uh, what a joy to be here again. It was uh, at the beginning of November last year when my wife and I were invited to your mission week. That was a great honor and blessing. And we came in this room and I spoke and you asked a few questions. And this year we have made the shortest uh, visit to the United States with my wife. And uh, we came purposely to attend the consecration of our longtime friend, Steve Wood in uh, South Carolina, uh, the rector of St. Andrew's Church in Mount Pleasant. And we came straight to Charleston on the 24th, ready to attend the consecration on 25th. Uh, it was a wonderful service and we were very, very happy indeed. And then we knew that we have friends in Pittsburgh. We made internal flights, and we, that's why we are here today. In a few hours' time, we shall be back at the airport to fly back to Charleston so that we can pack our bags, and then on Thursday, we fly home. What a joy to be here and to be a friend of you, most of you, those of you who are here, and making new friends. And uh, I want to thank again the dean, President for inviting us and for all of you for coming to listen to us. When, I was, when we were here last year, we never knew what the future had for us. But I told a few friends that you pray we are going to elect a new archbishop. And as I said in the chapel this morning, those of you who are there, by God's grace, we are 34 bishops. And you can imagine, like the shepherd boy David who was out in the field, the giants came and they said, don't you have more? And then David came out from the field. So I consider myself like the shepherd boy David to have been uh, called by God to be the eighth archbishop of the church of the province of Uganda. And uh, uh, I will tell you about what God has done through my life. Uh, when I was 19 years old, I committed my life to the Lord Jesus. I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And that made a very interesting turning point in my life. I was a youth leader, and it was in the youth group that I met, a, I met a good lady, and I looked at her, and I admired her, and dreamt and prayed and said, I want to marry you, and this is Mama Beatrice. For 34 <laughs> years, she has been a very strong companion. I can never imagine that I could have been a good pastor, a missionary, and uh, an archdeacon, and a son secretary, a bishop, uh, without her. And now we are going to be in that big responsibility. She is a very faithful companion. As I told you, sometime God has blessed us with five children and five grandchildren. Uh, the youngest is in university. The others have graduated. They are working. And uh, our uh, first grandchild is... Uh, four and a half. He is our friend. He's waiting. When I go back, he will ask me, a granddad, I want, uh, I want uh, football. And I get football for, her, for him. So uh, we have been blessed to be working in those different circumstances. We were born in thousand parts of Uganda. 41 years ago, we moved to the western part, northwestern part of Uganda. And then we were once, uh, for those who were not here last year, we were once missionaries in Karamoja, neighboring Kenya on one side and neighboring the Sudan for nine years. A very difficult, difficult area, but a, a mission field. And we were there uh, for nine years. Um, that is where I had my honeymoon. We went back to Hoima, uh, Bunyoro Kitara Diocese, and we worked there as diocesan. Uh, we were vicar first, then later diocesan secretary. And then I moved to uh, Namireme to be provincial secretary. And then Masindi people were ready. They said, come and be our first bishop. Founding a diocese is one of the most challenging assignments for us clergy. Those of you uh, who are clergy, uh, when you are anticipating to found a diocese, you will know. But you start from nothing. You start from nowhere. You don't have secretariat. But God has uh, led us. And want, I want before you to thank my good friend, uh, John McDonald, who has always organized mission uh, teams to come to the diocese. And we have always been encouraged by uh, him and his team coming. And when we were beginning, that is how God encouraged us to have 
partners in mission coming and working with us. We established a secretariat, sent people to college to study, and uh, our, our uh, priest, uh, Robina, was one of them. She went to UCU, and there are many who have been there. We sent Lydia last year, and there are many at UCU. There are many who have graduated. But we built a secretariat, made uh, the clergy feel that we are all serving the Lord. In ministry, or even when you are a bishop, you need to tell your people that they are your team members and our leader is Jesus Christ who calls us to serve him in his church. So I have enjoyed, though tough assignment, the eight years I have been the bishop of Masindi Kitara Diocese, making the Lord known and lifted high in the diocese, making the clergy my friends, Christians. It's not uh, enough to say, uh, I listen to people saying, my Lord Bishop, the Lord himself is the Lord of, his, of the church, the head of the church. But listening to the clergy, inviting them to have fellowship with me, because when they say, my Lord Bishop, I become a lonely bishop. I want, you can ask uh, Robina later, they have been my friends encouraging me. And when this uh, time uh, came around June, when we were nearing elections, uh, there were a lot of uh, propaganda in the papers. And I would tell them, let us pray that God gives us an archbishop of his choice, period. I wouldn't say anything beyond that. And my wife and I were praying that God will choose among the bishops a man of his choice. So we went to the retreat uh, for that time, and then the climax was the elections. And it is by secret ballot, and I, I was uh, picked up by God to be the next archbishop. I'm living a united diocese and developing and vibrant. Even when there are no financial resources, because in our country, in Uganda and other many parts of Africa, we have every other thing, we have food, but cash is a big issue. We don't have the money because we, we think we can produce and fill the world and have many children. But even uh, for us, we have five, but others have 10, 11, even our clergy. Then we have nephews and nieces who come in our, into our homes when the, the parents die, the next of kin, and then we take over. But what I rejoice about is that we are living a united, developing, peaceful diocese. And then also, because I am to move to Namirembe to be the provincial, uh, to be the archbishop, then we had to elect my successor. And before I came, that very Thursday when I was to fly with my wife, we had the House of Bishops, and by God's grace, we elected Canon George William Kasangaki to be the second bishop of Masindi Kitara Diocese. His consecration and enthronement will be on 25th of November so that legally I can abdicate and hand over the diocese to him before I can move to take over the new responsibility as Archbishop of Uganda. So uh, we are thanking God because sometimes election of a bishop can be political and tricky. Again, I was telling my people, Robin again is my witness, I was saying, Kalaji, don't, don't, comp don't campaign. And I, they used to ask me, whom do you think will succeed you? I said, God knows. I don't know, but God knows. That means I, I kept my hands clean so that I don't point at anybody so that later they will say, the, the archbishop did this mistake. So we are happy, people are happy. And uh, I am going back to prepare for the consecration of my successor very peacefully. Uh, the challenge in the church is that we have limited uh, human and financial resources. But I tell my people, we serve a rich God. Amen? Amen? Our God is not poor. He is a rich God. Poverty is sometimes in our minds and our hearts when we know that God has given us everything and we make ourselves available. He is a wonderful God. He blesses our ministry. He blesses us. Now, that's about the work I have done as a bishop for the last eight years. And now, what do I expect? Of course, leading the province is a big assignment. Life is going to change. It is already beginning to change. I'm learning to be referred to as Archbishop-elect and later as His Grace. I know the grace of God will be available for me to lead the whole Church of Uganda. Those of you who are in Chapa, I said 34 dioceses 
and then 11 million Anglicans in the Church of Uganda. As you know, uh, Uganda has one of the fastest growing populations in the world. The Church of Uganda is equally growing, and we are having some other dioceses in the making. So by the time maybe we get to five, six years, we shall be having more dioceses. But first and foremost is to keep the Church of Uganda united, focused on the Lord Jesus, lifting his name high, so that we can make our civil servants, businessmen and women, politicians, put God at the center. What is happening in our world, and maybe we are borrowing something which is not for, for God's glory, to be selfish, to think it is a global village when you have everything around you, the computers, the televisions. Uh, sometimes people have money, they tend to put God aside and divorce him from their uh, issues, politics, leadership, and other things. But when we put God at the center, then issues of corruption, which is so common in Uganda and other parts of Africa, will be minimized. Uh, we have the issues like child sacrifice, uh, other social injustices. So mine will not be to hit back the politicians, but to, to tell them, because most of them, every Sunday, they are in our pews in the church, either Catholic church, Pentecostal church, Anglican church. And when they go to parliament and they are elected in politics, they forget. They only come when they are looking for votes. And uh, 2016, we shall be doing more with another election. And that is when they be flocking in the church. But I want to use my opportunity to have dialogue and make them know or remind them the motto for our country is for God and my country. Sometimes people say for God and my stomach. <laughs> uh, so they want to be selfish, drive good cars. So that is my role. And to keep young people in the church, to keep them in the church because that is why they belong. They have a long future to enjoy. If they are misled and they take on modern ways of, of life, they can forget that they have a future to live and to enjoy. So young people will be my friends. Uh, women in Uganda, the women are the majority. A mother's Union, and when you want anything done in Uganda, tell Mother's Union. They will be there. They are the majority in the church. So uh, as I said in the morning, I want you to pray for me. I covet your prayers that as I take over this new responsibility, I will remain humble, like on, on that uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem when Jesus was riding on a donkey and people were uh, spraying, they are spreading their clothes and branches. They were singing, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. People should not see the archbishop, but see Jesus. But see Jesus. And I want to remain at that level that God will bless my ministry, my family, and the province of the Church of Uganda. I will stop here and invite questions. If you have some few questions from what I have said, uh, I will be happy to answer a few questions. You kind Thank of alluded you. to it um, in terms of the shortage of personnel and finances, but what, what do you think are some of the other major challenges that you will be experiencing as Archbishop? Uh, my major challenges, most of our clergy are in the afternoon of their ministry. You understand what I mean? They are about to retire. Bishops are retiring, the clergy. So our major challenge is to attract more people to the ordained ministry. Because we have seen it is a big challenge. Uh, we want more people trained. You know, sometimes I don't know in America, but in our country they say the church is a poor institution. We shall not get good pay. So men are not attracted to the ministry. And uh, that's a big challenge. There are more clergy retiring, and we need to... Uh, build personnel and have more clergy getting attracted to, to the ministry. That's a big challenge. And then, of course, uh, I have talked about uh, modern, modernization. I know in America you are looking at post-modernity, -modern but for us, people are still struggling to get to that level. So uh, people are wondering culture and mo modernization. So we are struggling. People now want to, in towns, to watch their televisions. They are, because some are making good money, they are not interested in going to church. And uh, they reach people. That's what I'm seeing. So we are seeing a shift. People trying to take on modern ways and not concentrating on following the Lord. Yes. What are your views and stands in relation to the Global Anglican Future Conference and how do you intend to move your progress? Very good question. I have been a member of the House of Bishops and, of course, Church of Uganda. 
and you know that we went to uh, Jerusalem in 2008 and now soon I'll be a member of the Primates Council and that is really at my heart. We want to continue encouraging that and the Primates are already planning for the second GAFCON uh, in October, they'll be in Dar es Salaam to plan for that. And I want to make sure the Church of Uganda continues to support the spirit of GAFCON as we look into the future that we can remain together and focused. And more so, uh, strengthening our relationship with the Anglican Church in North America. Uh, you will be happy to know that Archbishop Bob Duncan the Archbishop of the province in North America, is going to preach at my enthronement. And that is a way, it was uh, God's guidance that we invite him so that we strengthen our relationship between Church of Uganda and the new province in North America. So I will be more committed to ensure that I am part of the uh, leadership of GAFCON. And when we go to uh, Jerusalem, hopefully next year, uh, we shall uh, continue from where we stopped. But the primates have been meeting and I'll take over from where my brother, uh, the outgoing Archbishop Henry, will have stopped so that I continue to be part of, this, uh, of the fellowship and uh, continue to encourage GAFCON to be even stronger and keep uh, the people of God together uh, in one spirit. How do you see the, the relationship or, uh, with uh, Islam in, in Uganda? Uh, in Uganda, uh, until recently, the Muslims were 11%. They were the minority. But because of the money they get from the Arab world, uh, because a lot of money comes through from the Arab world to build mosques, mosques are mushrooming everywhere, even in villages and schools and hospitals. They want to go in through those uh, institutions. Uh, but we don't have in Uganda a big conflict, but they have a strategy. Our strategy is to evangelize and intensify discipleship, but for them, they have a strategy to convert people to Islam. And if they are children of the clergy, they are so somehow paid money. We don't, they don't advertise it, but that's what they do. But for us in Uganda, we, uh, we don't have uh, a conflict between us and the Muslims. But we know because of their presence and the link they have in the Arab world, they, are, they have a mission and a strategy to have more Muslims. So we also have to be on the alert and continue to intensify on, on discipleship and help our people to be strong Christians and follow Christ. Uh, when I went for summer break, I happened to be, uh, the, the diocese of Namire and Sunday school teachers visited our diocese. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions they were asking our bishop is uh, uh, the threat of uh, the Pentecostalism in uh, and how to deal with it. I realized it's like a problem to them, and then the issue of the youths, the modern youth and the, the old youths in the, in the admired. And I thank God that you have said in one of the things that you have and you want to look at is the ministry to the youth. So I just wanted to comment that uh, it is important to look at the youths and the differences that are coming and uh, how to retain them because most of them are getting away. That's right. uh, from the traditions, because they want to go to the vibrant churches, yes. good music, but they were against those things, and they were feeling like this is very Pentecostal and you can increase them. Well, um, uh, for most of you are theologians and you are students of theology, we are all Pentecostals because we believe in that Pentecostal experience and we can't have another Pentecostal experience. It happened at that time and we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. So when you are a leader and you say, this is not for us, it is for the other people, they are, that's a, a label, but even for us Anglicans, we consider we are Pentecostals. In, in Uganda, in Diocese is where we allow the young people to jump and shout and music aloud, they come back. So what is it that is taking them out? Like in Masindi, in St. Matthew's, at 6.30 a.m., the cathedral is full, and that is contemporary worship. The music is high. Even when we are in bed, we hear them singing, and the, the, the keyboard is high, and that is good. So the cathedral is full, and people, even uh, the others who had gone back, are coming back because they say, we are not missing anything here. So it is us, the leaders, to understand what is it that the youth want. So that they, if they are jumping for the Lord and praising him, why not? So we need to allow them, but they have to remain Anglicans. Don't allow them to, to wander away and keep them 
uh, within and help them to understand the Anglican tradition. So uh, Namirembe Cathedral has been conservative, but they are opening up. All Saints Cathedral Kampala, that's no problem. For us in Masindi, I was free to preach in the Pentecostal churches, and uh, they would, the Pentecostal pastors would come and preach and have fellowship together, and there was no problem. When we begin attacking and accusing each other, then that is where a problem is. We, we think we do it the best, we want to keep the tradition, and we are locking other people outside. So we want the young people to praise the Lord in the way they feel is convenient for them under the guidance of the uh, clergy uh, who have the leadership of the churches. Yes? You have a very unique and rich background in terms of you know, your ministry and the experience uh, from the place you were born, you were served in diverse dances, different cultures. And I, you, you know for a fact that one of the challenges we have in the church in East Africa is that slowly our dioceses are disintegrating to become tribal dioceses. And even clans are now beginning to demand that they want dioceses. And I'm just wondering, you know, how you are going to harness the experience you have had having served in the different parts of Uganda amongst different people to, to sort of just bring a culture where someone can come from the north and serve in the west without increasing problems or if looking at a broader church, someone come from Obasa and serve in Kampala. Um, uh, how would you speak to that? Oh, that's a good question and a good observation. Um, well, that is true. Uh, bishops are elected within their tribal areas. Uh, one major problem for us in Uganda is language. If, uh, one, if Eric comes uh, to Hoima, language will be a problem. Eric is from the north. And uh, so we don't have a language that unifies us as Ugandans. But that's not a good excuse. Missionaries came and they evangelized us. They didn't know the local language. In our constitution, provincial constitution, we even allow translation of bishops. That is, a bishop can be moved from one diocese to another. But it hasn't practically happened. So we need to put that into practice. Uh, it is only the center, those of you who know Uganda, Buganda region, because they speak uh, Luganda, uh, someone can come from the northern part of that region and go uh, to another part. But for us, uh, language is a barrier, but we need to overcome that so that we can, I'm sure it is the same in Kenya, I don't know, for Tanzania. So we need, that is a big issue. We, we, we uh, also promote tribalism without knowing. And that is not what the Lord wants, where uh, his people and he calls us to other places. So uh, people will learn from me because I'm a living example. And uh, I have had no problem with my wife working in all those places, even in Karamoja, where we didn't speak the language. We were there for nine years. So I think uh, the Lord has put me in that place that people will learn from me as an example and my wife. And gradually we can overcome that. So it's not an easy thing. But later we can pray about it, and I will be living as an example, and the people can say, ah, if we did it, we can do it. So, but it is a long-term thing. I wanted to add that you are a great example because you were elected bishop of a diocese that was not in your tribe. That's right. And you were successful as a bishop there, and so by that you've been able to model that somebody from another tribe can actually come in and be, and be successful as a diocesan bishop. But I'm a missionary myself. I'm a missionary with my wife, missionary-oriented. So you have to be a missionary-oriented person to have that spirit of going out. If those people are there and I, I, you, they, are, they are there surviving, why not you? Uh, you can go among uh, other people and you get enriched when you go into another culture. You learn more things from other people as they learn from you. Yes, Rinji? Um, in the African church, Generally, um, you cannot leave politics, the politics outside the church and the church because it affects each other. And what we know about, well, what we from Nigeria keep hearing uh, concerning Ugandan politics is a little cloudy. And um, the situations in Uganda, Nigeria is not doing any better either, so, but the situations in Uganda, how do you, what, what do you think? Will be your challenges and where you think you could make an input? Say, for instance, the Museveni issues. That's well, uh, the day I was elected, that's a good question, Rinji. 
uh, the press pushed me in the corner. What will you say about politics? And I said straight away, I am not a politician. I've been called to be a spiritual leader. I'll preach love and peace and reconciliation. But what does that mean? It doesn't mean that I'll condone evil, even when it is done by the politicians. I want to, as I have said before, I said, uh, let me preach the gospel, the good news. What is politics? The issues affecting the population. And we handle, as a church, more people. Uh, they come voluntarily to the church. Politicians have to put ready announcements, but for us, people come to church voluntarily. So I will have the opportunity. The, op the politicians will be there, and everybody will be there. It's not good to counterattack and hit back the politicians, especially when you are an archbishop. If I, have, if I want to talk to the president, I can make an appointment. It will be uh, possible for me to talk to him about issues uh, I don't feel happy about. And the House of Bishops can also invite the president and talk to him. Uh, if it is about, say, term limits, uh, hitting back and saying, President, resign or go retire, that will not be the best approach. I can ask for a dialogue, then we talk together about issues we see that are not pleasing Ugandans, uh, because we have had some bishops attacking that, it doesn't help, because we are not parliamentarians, it is always done in parliament, it has to go back and the legislature about it, so for us, I think what is better for us is to know that we are all responsible citizens of our country, religious leaders and civic and political leaders, let us see what do we need as uh, people of one country, where do we want our country to go, what is our future uh, projection, then we can help through our teaching and preaching uh, sermons and all that, that we can help people, even politicians, including the president, to be uh, reminded that he needs to be answerable to God first and then to the citizens. So that is my approach, but not hitting hard on, on political leaders, because I'm also a leader. Yes, Ross. Get tempted to say, my Lord Bishop, that <laughs> <laughs> uh, the fact is that women Raja ministry is not well developed in Uganda. Uh, from your experience as a bishop, what could be the main reasons for that, so that we can know what to pray for, because my heart is there. For two reasons. One, I'm a female priest. Two, women are the majority in the church. What could be the problems or the issues? Good, good, good question. One, our friends from other continents or from other countries will know that Uganda has no problem with women ordination. No problem. We started way back in 1980s and we ordained our women. So uh, we promote, and I will continue to promote the ordination of women and we don't have any conflict. There are some dioceses where there are women archdeacons. Uh, our friends in Kenya have, have had uh, the first provincial secretary, a woman, the canon I know, and uh, therefore we have no problem. But it is a cultural thing. Women are not confident themselves. There are few people, few women, who feel confident and they, want, they feel the call to go to the ordained ministry. But also the male domination is still a problem they will try to suffocate or to block uh, some of the young women who want to go. Some think, ah, how can we trust a young woman? She will not manage. But uh, I'm again in that field an example. Let me tell you, when I sent Lydia here, and then I sent Robina, they said, the bishop is training only women. And I said, that's not true, because I, I sent someone to Redcliffe in, in England to do masters, Canon George, now he's going to succeed me. I sent a young man to UCU doing masters. He has first degree in education. There are more people uh, who have been uh, sent to college. I have many, I have about two. I have one who is a parish priest. She's a, a woman. Then I have the Mother's Union worker who is a woman and ordained. And then I have uh, Lydia and Robina. So uh, we don't see many young women responding the, to the call to come to the ministry. I don't know in, in Lango, I don't know in Renzori, but for us, in Masindi Kitara Diocese, where I have been uh, the bishop, we have no problem in uh, sending uh, 
women who are called to the ordained ministry and to leadership. But the women will be themselves uh, a problem to their fellow women in some areas. They feel, ah, when I sent Lydia to All Saints, a big, de a big delegation came to me, Bishop, people will leave the church because you are bringing a woman. I said, is it because she puts on skirts? Is it because she's a woman? And I said, don't you trust that I can give you a good person? And when she came and started, they apologized. They said, we were wrong. Bishop, forgive us. So you have to, we have to help our people to have that liberated mind. And uh, in other areas, even in the West, they, they have a problem with the ordination of women. But for us in Uganda and Kenya, uh, we don't have a problem. So we need to encourage women. And women also have to have the confidence and respond to the call. You have to have a good mentor who can encourage you. We all need encouragers, don't we? Even men we need to be encouraged. So I think what we need to do is to overcome that uh, gender issue and we, we move ahead. We have to take one last question. Are you happy to take one final one? Yes. John, go ahead. You go ahead, David. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just going to ask, um, you know, you, you've traveled in the United States a number of times, and you've seen our churches. I was wondering if, if you had one challenge that you'd give the Anglican churches in North America. What would you challenge us with? Mm, that's a hard question. I come as a visitor. You receive me. Uh, what can I say? Uh, uh, because of what I hear, like this Amea group, uh, Instead of being more united, uh, they are not in the Episcopal Church. There is a group. So I think we need to come to, to the cross and uh, overcome our differences and then move together. So uh, I, would, I know that here in America, there are people who are standing with us, and uh, Trinity and uh, uh, this uh, Diocese of Pittsburgh and the New Province, we have been moving together. But there are other people, because they have their personal differences, they intend to go their own way. So can we go back to the cross and then find uh, all our differences uh, forgiven and then we move together? So that is the message we need to take across, that we serve Christ, not our own interests. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to God for Bishop and, and wife and for being with us today. We'll say a prayer in a moment. Let's talk about it.